Our next speaker is Maria Reed. Um, Maria is the working partner of Scout Proft. And Scout um, wanted to be here this morning very much. She unfortunately is sick in bed with pneumonia. And Maria has kindly stepped in to, to speak for and about Scout. Um, Maria wanted to say, oh, I'm just the moped guy, but I don't believe her at all. She has a story of her own to share with you, and we're really excited to have her. Let me tell you a little bit about the farm that she and Scout um, have, have together. It's a CSA farm. Um, they're poultry producers. It's called Someday Farm in Dorset. And um, it's, it's a, it's a small-scale farm as by almost any standard. Um, but the message of the farm is a diverse one. Scout and her family, um, have, she has five homeschooled children um, who also work on the farm. They produce organic vegetables, compost, eggs, maple syrup, meat birds. They have six or maybe not quite 6,000 chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, pheasants. And they also produce saw logs. Uh, most of the income from Sunday Farm comes from a 100-member CSA where families purchase shares up front and then benefit from the farm's offerings year-round. Um, Scout and Maria sell produce at a farmer's market and a farm stand on a busy road near their farm. They don't sell wholesale at this point, but they know that they need to remain flexible as markets and competitors evolve. Um, Scout described how Someday Farm has broadened its markets by developing value-added products offering applewood smoked chicken and turkey um, that allow them to double the revenue of their poultry sales. They sell sausage and ground turkey. Um, and Scout also tries to make maximum use of all of the buildings, raising winter greens in the greenhouses in the, in the off season and using the sugar house to dry herbs and flowers in the summer. So Maria, welcome on behalf of Someday Farm and on behalf of Scout, who would want to be here, and I'm very glad you're willing to step in for her. Thank you. I want to give a fast shout out to Mara Hurst also. I couldn't be doing this without my, my side wing right here, so thanks, Mara. In February 2010, I spent a Saturday night at a hotel room in Burlington, the Windjammer Hotel. I was about to attend my first NOFA conference. I was nervous. I didn't know a soul. I had just come off two days of a teacher placement job fair in Boston. In my non-Vermont life, I'm an English teacher and dean of faculty at an all-boys boarding school in New York State. Well, the contrast between those two conferences couldn't have been more stark. Coat and tie and polished shoes versus Carhartts, boots, and wool hats. Anxiety versus high energy. On Sunday morning, I listened to Jack Laser deliver his keynote address in Ira Allen Chapel. To make a long story short, Jack's talk and the entire NOFA conference inspired me to take an unpaid sabbatical from my teaching job. A month later, I made cold calls and interviewed 15 farmers around the state. I wanted to find out what was happening in Vermont. What made our state's ag scene so vibrant? One of the first farmers who returned my call was Scout Proft. Sure, come on up. I'll be seated in the greenhouse. Between Jack's talk and my two-hour visit with Scout, along with the other 15 farmers I met that month, my life changed. I knew I was living in a state filled with the most intelligent, inspiring, and innovative people I have ever met. Farmers who are true educators and passionate risk takers. From June to November 2010, I traveled Vermont and interviewed more than 100 farmers and people in ag-related businesses. Many of you are in this room today, and I am deeply appreciative of the time and insights you shared with me. You opened your homes, you opened your farms, you opened your hearts. That experience also changed my life, literally. Since then, I have become a working partner with Scout at Someday Farm. Scout and I have determined that we were separated at birth. Come, I got about 30 pounds on her. Um, come June, I will, leave, I'm, I will leave my teaching job of 27 years so I can work full time at Someday Farm and continue my writing. I, 
I never dreamed I would be standing here helping with the Sunday address, but this one is for my dear friend Scout and for Mara, who came on, to board, who came on board to Someday Farm last year. We call ourselves the three-legged stool, and when one leg is shaky, the other two provide the balance. This is Scout's story, a glimpse into her life on a hillside farm in Dorset. So here's a thumbnail view of Someday Farm. We grow five acres of mixed veg, we have five large greenhouses, 5,000 birds, one acre of small fruits, maple sugaring, a few cows, a woodlot, and a compost operation. We also view education as a product, a service we provide to the community. And all this happens on a hillside farm with rocky soil on barter leased land. In order to move ahead and become viable, we had to be innovative. We had no money. In 1980, we were clearing the land with bow saws and borrowed equipment. Scout and Matt were the growers, the construction crew, everything. Scout was also homeschooling her five children. Someday Farms efforts involved every generation. Friends, family, community members, school children, apprentices, from age 14 to 80. People came because they were excited. Our energy drew them in. Volunteers were intrigued, entertained, and energized. They helped and they learned. It was an amazing feeling of community. So why do people innovate? People innovate because of financial necessity. Having no money forces creative thinking. We innovate because of land usage. We choose crops that fit our land rather than forcing our land to grow what we want. Someday Farms land has been in Scout's family since the 1930s. We innovate to keep ourselves fresh, challenged, and engaged. I think of Jack Laser and his work with grains and new corn varieties, or John Hayden with his small fruit trials, and all the goat cheese makers who prove that real Vermonters do, in fact, milk goats. So what were, some, what were Someday Farms innovations over the last 30 years? Keep in mind that these were cutting edge experiments 30 years ago, and now they're considered standard practices. Also, each one had a direct financial impact on the business. Every innovation stemmed from financial necessity, also known as desperation. Land usage, 1982. We had to figure out how to make the most of our hillside land and poor soil. Scout told me the other day she couldn't even afford potting soil back then, so she harvested soil from the forest and mixed it with peat moss she found in a nearby bog. Sound like Scout? Our first cash crop was green beans, which we had turned into dilly beans. We planted half an acre of green beans and processed them each night and packed them into, hand, into jars with handmade labels. Dilly beans are so common now, but not then. But those beans, those beans gave us the money to move forward. Greenhouses came next. In 1984, we put up our first livestock greenhouse, 96 feet, and put turkeys in there. At that point, people thought we were crazy. Greenhouses are for plants, not animals. But we did it, and it worked. Developing markets. Bib lettuce, 1980. Scout was at a Mofka workshop in Maine and visited Tony Box Farm. It was a hillside terraced farm, and his land looked like our land. He was growing 500, leads of butter, 500 heads of butter crunch bib lettuce. Tony would harvest a head of lettuce with one hand and plant a new one with the other. Scout thought, hmm, I could do this. He said, these terraced rows make more money than those. At that, he turns and points to the 60 Jersey cows behind him. Scout took the idea back here to Vermont. She kept bringing heads of this beautiful lettuce to the Dorset Inn each week, and eventually they realized we had a great product. We established that relationship and built our market. Next came chickens. In 1987, a woman in town named Barbara Ketchum had encouraged Someday Farm to raise meat birds on a commercial scale because no one in the area was doing it. Scout and Matt were processing 200 chickens under a tarp in the front yard. Scout probably had a baby strapped on her back. In October, October 4th, 1987, we had a freak snowstorm on the processing day. The snow piled up overhead and the tarp eventually collapsed. Barbara Ketchum called all her friends and anyone she knew and told them to come up and buy the chickens. Within minutes, there was a stream of people driving up our hill with coolers as snow piled up and buying the chickens right out of the ice water tubs. In less than two hours, all 200 chickens had been sold. It was our first CSA pickup. <laughs> Within the next two years, Someday Farm graduated to a state-inspected processing room. We could now provide a better product and establish ourselves more securely within our community. 
And the farm now raises, as I said, 5,000 chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, pheasants. Did I get it all, Mara? Okay, good, good. We innovate to keep ourselves fresh and challenged. Now that Someday Farm had the processing room and had honed our skills, we wanted to push to the next level. We had bills to pay and a loyal base of customers. We needed to find a place to raise pheasants on our hillside, so Scout ordered another 96-foot greenhouse. However, we could, only form the f we could only form the frame and not the plastic, so we draped the pheasant netting over the ribs and used it as a flyway for three years. Eventually, the pheasant sales paid for the greenhouse, plastic and walls and heaters. By the early 1980s, Scout had gotten buttercrunch lettuce down pat and was looking for a change. Jay Lashinsky was working for Renee's Seeds of California at that point. He told Scout about something called mesclin greens. Harvest at teaspoon size, $12 a pound, huh, nobody's gonna buy that stuff. Trust me, said Jay, this stuff is gonna take off. Jay was right. Restaurants went crazy and Scout thought they hit the jackpot. Innovations can't be fads, but you don't know. You have to try to take the risk sometimes. Cut your losses when it goes nowhere. Anybody remember edible flowers? Enough said. <laughs> As farmers, we invest heavily in our community. It's the truest form of social security. For 30 years, Someday Farm has fed and nurtured our community, and in tough times, they support us. Uh, a long time, I don't even know how long ago it was, Enid. Uh, Scout started the farmer correspondence with school kids, and that's a program that's still going strong today. Scout's been great about welcoming school, school trips to the farm, but it's not a petting zoo model. She puts the kids to work and teaches them about sweat equity with skills like planting garlic, pruning raspberry canes, harvesting potatoes, laying down black plastic. Interns and apprentices. Someday Farm has, had th has, has, has 20 years of hosting and training young people, many of whom go on to become successful farmers and homesteaders themselves. Special development with skill development with special needs kids. Scout has worked with a local school and helped train these children in how to collect, wash, and pack eggs, fill flats with soil, and thin transplants. It's a win-win for everyone. And then the farm stand. Someday Farms Red, St Red Stand along Route 30 is a community hub. We teach as much as we sell product. And we also, picked up, we also pick up bag food residuals from local schools for our compost. Each school gets some training in the process. However, things have not always been so rosy. For about five years, probably in the, in somewhere in the 1980s, we were, growing on three, we were growing three acres of mixed veg and raising 2,000 pheasants on leased land with a handshake agreement. At the height of the season, Scout and Matt were thrown off and given one week notice. A horse show had bought the land. So they pulled the equipment and harvested everything they could. A week later, riding rings covered what had been the fields. We cast about, after that, we cast about in search of a farm stand location. We landed one place that had great access. Location, location, location. But as the summer wore on and the owner saw cars streaming in and out, he thought we were making a killing, even though the average sale was 12 bucks. So he decided to charge us $1,000 a month, plus insurance. We were thrown out, again, based on a complete misconception. So Scout Bean Scout came up with Plan B. 1996, J.K. Adams. J.K. Adams was adding a new kitchen store in Dorset. She saw a parking lot and a new kitchen store. She thinks, hmm, food, product. Scout made a proposal to set up a farm stand on his property along Route 30. He had a new kitchen store, and we had the vegetables and products. We would use his wooden salad bowls for our display, and he would carry our newsletter in his store. The owner was reticent, but gave us a one-year trial shot. Turns out he had always wanted to be a farmer, but felt compelled to follow in his family business. So he let us set up a small tent canopy, nothing permanent. He was testing us, watching us. We did it, and it worked. Our customers became his, and we both had increased sales. A year later, in 1997, he let us build our stand on his property. In fact, he gave us the wood milled from his very own trees, and community members helped us build it. He had seen we were serious, and we held the same standards for quality as he did. Our farm stand at J.K. Adams has become a community hub, a symbol of Dorset. We are Dorset's only working farm, and people are proud of us. 
Meanwhile, Scout had been having some intense farm stand conversations with a young couple named Mike and Michelle from New Jersey. They had bought a defunct dairy farm, 55 acres along Route 30. They would come for a few ears of corn and would leave with an earful of Scout. <laughs> they, they were thinking of subdividing the land and building four homes. To make a long story short, she put the idea in their head to conserve their land and use it for agriculture. What she didn't know is that they had been watching her and determining whether they should partner with Someday Farm. That winter, Scout wrote Mike and Michelle a letter and proposed that we plow up the land and grow a couple acres of mixed veg. They agreed. We did it, and it worked. Then in the second year, another intern was looking to start an ag business, so Scout suggested cows. The intern bought a small herd of heritage breed cows and moved them onto the land with another handshake agreement. We also installed 500 layers in the pole barn. So now we had vegetables, cows, poultry, all cohabitating peacefully on another handshake agreement plot of land. At some point, Mike and Michelle looked out their window and thought, oh my goodness, we got a farm. Mike got all fired up by what we were doing and he wanted to get in on the action. He planted two and a half acres of small fruits. He had gotten the bug despite not having a foundation in agriculture. His background is finance, New York stock market. He would come up on weekends and not see us working because we were deliberately staying away to give them their space. So they must have thought, hmm, this farming thing's pretty easy. <laughs> Next came the asparagus beds, bees, and compost and then horses and pigs. So fast forward to 2012. Scout has come up with an innovative, an innovative solution, a culmination to 30 years of collaborating and investing in our community. It's called Three Farm. We now have three generations working a for-profit collective farm. It's called Three Farm, this 55-acre piece owned by Mike and Michelle and barter leased to us. It's a collaboration between their beef cows our fruits and vegetables, and a few other businesses. There's a small self-serve self store in the barn where people can purchase our eggs, chickens, and greens. Two other farms provide beef and pork. Mike and Michelle's three middle school boys will be starting a small Christmas tree and pumpkin enterprise. After several years in New Zealand and England, Scout's son Eben has come home to raise game birds. Scout will continue with the vegetables, of course, um, Mara, oh, I'm, I'll skip ahead. Uh, 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 I will be doing the, I'm doing the compost operation out of the uh, teacher desk onto a tractor. It's been kind of a fun learning experience to say the least. Uh, Mara will be doing the small fruits and helping with the vegetables. And another son, Lewin, may pursue a commercial kitchen for value added products. He's a passionate chef. And their youngest son, Anders, <laughs> Give a 15-year-old a gun and call it predator control, a match made in heaven. <laughs> this three-farm collective model is based on, number one, mutual dreams. Anyone who knows Scout knows that she dreams big. Number two, shared resources. Three, separate enterprises that contribute to and benefit from our closed-loop system. And number four, serving our community while providing income for committed individuals. If all goes accordingly, the land will support six different enterprises. We are using every aspect of this second farm combined with our home farm, and all because of a seed planted into the heart and mind of a receptive young couple. I hope that in the audience today, there are some people who have land and are looking to support aspiring farmers. I hope in the audience today, there are aspiring farmers will be bold enough to look around and make a proposal to a community member or dare to dream an outrageous scheme. I hope that in the audience today there are farmers or producers who will come up with innovations that will become standard practices for all of us in the next 10 years. 30 years ago it was raising birds in greenhouses and creating CSAs and taking a risk on this stuff called mesclin. So here's the challenge. Everyone in this room needs to be accountable for the future of Vermont agriculture. Some need to grow foods not currently being grown in this state. Some need to come up with value-added products that make you some money. Some need to open up their land and support a three-farm model. Some of you seasoned farmers need to reach out and mentor new farmers in your community. And some need to develop the innovative practices that will become our standard ops in the coming years. 
We all need to support NOFA and other organizations who give us the tools, the heirlooms, to keep Vermont at the forefront of sustainable agriculture. And lastly, we all need to demand, demand Vermont product everywhere we shop. Question managers and store owners on the origin of our food. Scout has asked, leave here with a promise to yourself and to the future of Vermont. This is more than a challenge, it's our responsibility. Why are we all committed to this backbreaking labor of love? We're doing this for our friends, our family, and our community. On behalf of Scout, thanks.